Hi guys, in this video we are going to take a closer look at the partial likelihood. In the original paper, this was mistakenly termed conditional likelihood, but later it was renamed partial likelihood. The main insight is that since h0 is arbitrary, we cannot get any information on beta at times when no events happen. h0 could be zero at that time for all we know. So we only focus on a subset of the events, not the sensors. But the sensors still play a role as part of the risk set. As we shall see, each term in the product is the probability that subject i had an event at ti given the risk set at ti and that someone had an event at ti. As a side note, it has been shown that the partial likelihood is also the likelihood of the ranks, the order of the events, without the actual times. Unfortunately, Cox never gave a complete rigorous derivation of the partial likelihood. Maybe thought it's too obvious, but anyway, since I never found a satisfying derivation, I will attempt to make one myself in the next few slides. So starting with each individual term, let us see that this is indeed equal to the probability that subject i had an event at ti, given that someone had an event at ti and the risk set. Using the definition of conditional probability, we get that this is equal to this. Now, the intersection will be only subject i with event at ti. And assuming the events are independent, the only information given by the risk set is that subject i survived until ti. The fact that other subjects survived does not affect the probability of subject i to survive. Hence, we make this change in the numerator. Likewise, for the denominator, we can write someone with event as the sum over the individual probabilities. This again makes use of the independence property, where the probability of a union is equal to the sum of probabilities. Now, assuming discrete time, each term in the numerator and the denominator is actually the definition of the discrete hazard. Plugging in the Cox model for each hazard, we get this quantity, and noticing that h0 cancels out, we are left with the desired quantity. Here we have the same proof, but a bit more formal. Let's assume the subjects are ordered by their corresponding times and omit the usual parentheses. Remember that we can describe our data using the t's, the times, and the deltas, a binary variable indicating an event or a sensor. Someone with an event at ti can be written like this. Either t1 is equal to ti, or t2, or etc., etc., or tn. Technically, we should also write the deltas, but for brevity, let's omit them. The risk set at ti can be written like this. Now, remembering the distribution law, we notice that all the t's before i will become the empty set. So for brevity, we will also omit them. Writing the same derivation as before becomes this, where in the first star we use the independence to ignore the condition on anything but the current variable, and we make the probability of a union a sum of probabilities, and in the second star we assume discrete time. You can pause the video to verify for yourself. But how did we even get to these individual terms? Well, by a special way of partitioning the full likelihood. We'll denote by delta of time ti equal one, that someone had an event at ti, and by r of ti, the risk set of ti. And we'll again omit the individual deltas. Suppose we have three subjects, and that the first and third experienced events, while the second was censored. The full likelihood, given disease and that we ordered the times, is equal to this. But we want to write it like this, by adding the risk sets and the general deltas. Why are we allowed to do so? Well, because we added events that are a superset of the current events. Remember that the comma is just a short form for intersection, and that if a set is a subset of another set, then their intersection will be the first set. Then subject one had an event at time t1 is a subset of someone had an event at t1. And likewise, subject one had either an event or a sensor at t1, if we order the variables, is equal to this, which is a subset of the risk set at t1. Using the chain rule of probability, we will decompose the probability as follows. The events related to t1 times t2 given t1 times t3 given t1 and t2. We will further decompose the joint of t1 as follows. Since we don't care about sensors, again, h0 might be zero at t2 for all we know, we will collapse this probability and just denote it as p2. We will do the same for this probability in pink, which we will call P1. We will now decompose T3 in the same manner. Notice that for the probability of T3, the random variable, equal T3, the value, 
and delta 3 equal 1, we do not care about delta 2 or delta 1. And given the risk set at T3, we don't care for the previous risk set. Note that the risk set at T3 does depend on the previous risk set. So we got that the full likelihood is equal to the product of the partial likelihood in purple and cayenne times the other terms, P1, P2, and P3, which we will ignore. The assumption is that the other terms don't contain much information or any about beta. This was shown to be true asymptotically as the number of events go to infinity. Note that the pink P1 could actually have canceled some terms in the individual partial likelihood term in purple, but this is not true for any subsequent partial likelihood terms. So to recap, we saw how to decompose the full likelihood into the partial likelihood and other terms we can't reason about, and also how each term in the partial likelihood individual term is equal to this quotient. Hence, we understand a bit better how we got to the partial likelihood and hopefully made this quantity a bit less cryptic. That's all for this video. I hope you found it useful and see you in the next one.